Welcome to the Sunday Morning Podcast from the Stronghold Church Weaverham. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. It is an absolute honor and privilege to be with you. I want to read two passages of scripture. Um, I want to read Romans 12, uh, verse 2, and I want to read a little passage in, in, the, second, in the book of Kings, 2 Kings 2, uh, from 6 to uh, 17. And um, the first scripture um, in Romans, Romans 12, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. So let us not be conformed to the world, but let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect unto God. And that's, I guess, one of the things that we need to do. And the other scriptures, uh, 2 Kings uh, 6, 12. Um, 2 Kings 6, 12, and then reach about 17. And it's, um, it's when Israel were fighting Syria. They were at war. And um, the story was the king of Syria, he, 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 he was setting his plans to invade Israel. Uh, and um, every time he said, right, we're going to do this and we're going to do that, the prophet Elisha, God told him what was going on. He told the king of Israel, and so they set a trap and they beat them up. So after a few times of that, the king of Syria said, you know what, we've got a spy in the camp. Who is the spy in the camp that's revealing to the king what's going on? And they said, no, 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 we haven't got a spy, but that guy, Elisha. So this is where the story picks up. So he says, uh, he said, so one of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who's in Israel, he tells the king the words that you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> All right, everything's being revealed here. And he said, so the king's really angry. He says, right, go and see where he is and send me and get him. And it was told him that he's in Dothan. He said, therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. That, and they came by night, surrounded the city. So you can imagine the story. And then the servant of Elisha woke up and he uh, looked out the window. And the armies were surrounding the city. And he panicked. He was like, alas, master, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And the master got up and he said, he said, fear not. Don't be afraid. Now, he must have thought he was crazy. You, don't you see the armies around? He says, fear not. He says, fear not. Because there's more with us than with them. The servant must know the guy's lost his mind now. Do you not see what's going on? Fear not. Okay. Why? Because there's more with us than again. All right, he's, you know, some, yeah. And <laughs> so Elisha prayed and said, okay, Lord, please just open his eyes that he might see. And the Lord opened his eyes and the young man saw and behold, the mountains were filled with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And I rejoice because family, let me tell you, this is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. Uh, and the message I want to share with you today, I've entitled it, As God Sees. As God Sees. Now, Scripture often uses the imagery of blindness to describe the condition where people are either unwilling or unable to perceive divine revelation. Now, the things of God are not uh, perceived by observation or inquiry, but by revelation and illumination. And so at the outset of Jesus' ministry, uh, Jesus set publicly his, his, his claim to the messianic office when he revealed himself as the one who would fulfill what the prophet Isaiah said, proclaim Ming the recovery of sight to the blind. It is the Lord that gives sight. And so if we want to be successful Christians today, it is vital, it is vital that not only do we see, but we see as God sees. If we really want to impact our community, 
It's not just about seeing, but we must see as God sees. If we want to do great exploits, I guess as Mike is doing with that cross right now, we must see as God sees. You see, the biggest challenge that we will face in life is not the problems that lie in front of us. That's not our biggest problem. The biggest problem and the biggest challenges that we face aren't the problems. The biggest challenges are how we see those problems. And there is a difference. You see, how we see it, how we perceive it determines our reality. It doesn't matter what the truth is. It's how you see it that is your reality. And so, can I have slide one, please? And so, you see, it's about our perception. Now, I ask a question. What do you see? Which monster is the biggest? You see, uh, which, which monster is the biggest? The one at the back. It looks it's, it's obvious, right? What we see becomes our reality. And most people, when we look with the natural eye, we see something that is not necessarily the truth. We see a truth. In actual fact, both monsters, the big guy at the back and the little guy at the front, they are exactly the same size. They are exactly the same size. I, I showed this in school once when I was talking about perspective. I was talking to the kids, and there was a teacher observing at the back. And then she put her hand up. All the kids said, yes, sir. The teacher put her hand up and said, that can't be right. I said, what do you mean? She said, they're not the same size. I said, yes, they are. She went and got a ruler. <laughs> And she measured, and she said, oh my gosh, they're the same size. I said, that's perspective. It might look away, but actually it's different. Our, our, it's our perspective, our perception of the situation that makes us react in a certain way. It's our, our, our perception of the situation that makes us magnify stuff and sometimes blow them out of proportion. It's our perspective on the situation that sometimes makes a... Uh, it turns a mole in, into a mountain or a storm in a teacup. It's, it's that what makes it bigger than it really is. And, and, and family, the fact is this. The devil, he will attack our perception. That's where we'll get. You see, he, he will attack how we can see things, how, how things kind of look. That's what he will attack. And so when you think about it, when, 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 when we go through life, that is really what we've got to try and hold on to. You see, if the devil can mess up your perception, you're going to think of yourselves in ways that you shouldn't think of yourself. You're going to go places that you never thought you would go to because you've got a messed up perception. Now, we are children of the king, and we need to accept that. We are the servant of the most high God. That means something, but the devil wants us to think it doesn't mean anything. He wants us, like everybody else, to say, miracles, what's that? No, can't you see? The monster at the back is bigger than... No way. And so he's trying to attack our perception. Now, Eve had a messed up perception when the devil came to her and said, but did God say that you should not eat this fruit? And because of the way the fruit looked good, and, and so she had a messed up perspective, and man messed up. And then Israel, they had a messed up perspective when they, uh, they, they went into Canaan, and they came back, the 12 spies, you remember them? And they came back, and they were really messed up. Now, all the devil had to do is let them see something that they shouldn't be looking, see themselves different. And they came back, and they said, you know what? We look like grasshoppers in their eyes, let alone our eyes. How do they know what they were thinking? But their perspective was so messed up, they said, there's no way we can take this land because we are nothing in their sight. Then there was Jonah. Remember Jonah? Jonah had a messed up perspective because he thought, I'm just going to run. I hear what God wants me to do. I'm going to run from God. You can run, but you can't hide from God. And if you run, he's just going to find you. And so you, you, he thought, I could do this. I can outrun God, and you can't do that. And so you got the optimist, and you got the pessimist. The optimist, uh, the guy that sees the half empty, and the pessimist, no, the half full, <laughs> and the pessimist, you know, half empty. You know, the, there's, there's one guy that sees the donut, and the other guy sees the hole. <laughs> An half empty kind of guy says, you know, I can't do it. I'm not enough. I could never overcome this. And the half full guy says, well, we're more than enough. 
life will always throw stuff at us. It doesn't matter if we're saved or not. There'll always be issues, trials. There'll always be obstacles to go through. There'll always be problems, but there'll also be opportunities. And you see, when we come to Christ, things do not change. When we come to Christ, we still go through all those things. Sometimes, you know, people think, well, I came to Christ and things got worse. Yeah, that's what will happen sometimes. <laughs> but you see, on the outside, it gets worse, but we just get better. And we just get stronger. And God uses every situation to prove us. But you see, it's not so much about the stuff that we go through. I'm here to tell you, if we change our perception, we'll change our lives. If we can but see as God sees. Now, what makes one person's perception so much different from another? Now, this slide revolutionized my life many, many, many years ago. What do you see? Does anybody see an, a old, what would you see, an old woman? Anybody see an old woman? Let me put your hand up if you see an old woman. Put your hand up if you see a young woman. All right. <laughs> Put your hand up if you don't see anything. <laughs> All right. So we've got old woman, young woman. Put your hand up if you see both. Okay, we've got a few that see both. Uh, so I'll leave it on there for a while so some of you will see. The optimists in the house, you're going to see the young lady. <laughs> when I first came across this, I was at a training course, and... Um, I was sitting next to a guy, and the guy next to me said, uh, he said, what do you see? I said, I see a young woman, of course. And he, he looked at me straight, and I thought, well, why are you looking at me like that? I said, what do you see? He says, I can see a old ag. And I thought, what? I said, what do you mean? Because I, I could only see the young woman. That's all I could see. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's a old ag. I said, no, it's not. It's a young woman. So this argument went on for a while. And then I said to him, I don't know what you're talking about. Then he said, no, it's, it's an old woman. So this argument went on. Then I, I, I got a little cross with him because I'm thinking, now you're being silly, right? Look, look, you're joking aside, what can you see? Old ag. I said, you're really silly now. <laughs> and I was sitting next to him and I thought, you know what? I don't like you. I moved further. <laughs> <laughs> that's no way a whole act. That's a young woman. Come on. Anybody can see that. Now, the thing is, I was a kind of black and white kind of guy. You're either lying or you're telling the truth. All right? It's either black or it's white. Don't tell me about bits in the middle. I wasn't interested in that. That's how I used to be. And then later on, uh, after he's over there and I'm now over here, and we're not talking to each other because he's being silly and he thinks I'm being silly, uh, <laughs> The instructor came on, the, the coach, and he was saying, well, for those of you who can see the old woman, I'm thinking, old woman? What old woman? And then he pointed it out. Can everybody see the old woman? <laughs> All right, so, old woman's eyes, ear, chin, mouth. Get it? Yeah. And then the young woman. Right, this is the young woman's hair. This is uh, eyelash. A chin, that's an ear roll. And so when I saw that, it literally changed my view instantly. I realized that actually it's possible now that you can actually see two people can be looking at the same thing and see two different things. And for me, this was life-changing. I realized two people can be seeing something, seeing a situation, and they're both telling the truth. But the fact is, they're both seeing something different. It changed my counseling. <laughs> because believe me, I said, no, well, if you're telling the truth, then he's got to be lying. And if he's telling the truth. But actually, two people can be saying what they believe is the truth. Perhaps they're both wrong. <laughs> and so it's not just black and white. It's about perspective. What do you see? The fact is, people will always see things differently. People will go through the same situation. One person will come back and say, oh, my God, it's crazy. And then somebody else will run out and say, it was wonderful, it's beautiful. 
two shoe salesmen. They go, to, they go to Africa, to the deepest part of the jungle, and they're shoe salesmen, right? And then within a few days, the first one goes back, he phones home, he says, I'm on the first plane back home. They say, why? Because they don't wear shoes over here. The next guy phones up, he says, send more shoes. They say, yep, yeah, why? He says, because they don't wear shoes over here. <laughs> it's about perspective. It's about how you see it. You know, I went to India, and uh, when I went to India some years ago, it was probably the most emotionally challenging thing for me because we went into some of the shanty towns, they call them the untouchables, and it was devastating. I, I, it was such a culture shock. And, and uh, I was with Peter, and, and they were inviting us into little huts. I mean, sort of so big, and, and they'd be inviting us in. And I was thinking, I'm not going in there. And then I'm like, we're with them, and me and people looking at each other, and they're saying, come into my home. I was thinking, that. <laughs> and then Peter goes in, and I've got to go in now. <laughs> And then you have to, because you can't stand up in it. And, and I'm, you know, you're, you're there and, and I'm thinking, oh my God, how can people, I'm feeling so sorry for them. My heart is going out. But then the kids are happy. The guy lives in there with his wife and his four kids. And you're thinking, how oh, is this possible? But they're happy. I'm thinking, how can you be happy? How is it possible to be happy? How, how could you possibly be happy? They can be happy because it's a different perspective. Completely different perspective. I went back, I came back home. And I was a changed man. I said to the kids, you ever say you're poor again? I'm going to stop. <laughs> I went to school and I said, let me tell you, kids, you guys have it good. You need to come with me to India. Talk about what you haven't got. It's about perspective. It's about perspective. And um, Gideon, he had a perspective, didn't he? Gideon, you remember Gideon, the story? Gideon, he didn't think, he was like an half-empty kind of guy. He didn't think he had much. He didn't think he was able to do much. And, 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 and he thought, well, I can't do it. I'm not enough. Uh, I'm just not the kind of guy. And I guess he would have been seeing, when you gave him a donut, he'd be saying, you give me a hole. You know, he'd have been seeing the half-empty all the time. And some of us are like that. We, we don't see what we really have. We don't see who we, we really are. We look at ourselves and sometimes we see failure. We see we're not enough. We haven't got enough money. We haven't got the resources. Uh, we don't know enough. Lord, you better find somebody else. I couldn't possibly do it. Lord, I haven't got enough anointing. I haven't got this. Gideon said, my family are, are, are weakest in Manasseh. And me... Father, I'm the, weak, I'm the least in my father's house. Please have me excused. How many times do we look at ourselves and say, Lord, it couldn't possibly be me. I couldn't possibly do that. But, but, but in that story, the angel showed God's view of Gideon. Gideon discounted himself. Not me, can't do it, forget it. Me, me. And an angel said, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. Who, Me? The mighty man of valor. Gideon had never done anything mighty or valiant in his life. But the angel saying, the mighty man of valor. You see, uh, the angel and God wasn't looking at him as, uh, 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 next slide. God wasn't looking at him as he saw himself. God wasn't looking at him as he saw himself. <laughs> and some of us, we only see our situation as we see. God is the only one because he sits out of time. And he sits in eternity, and he sees the beginning, he sees the middle, and he sees the end all at the same time. You see, God can look at something ugly and call it beautiful. God can look at someone sinful and call them righteous. He can look at someone broken and call them whole. He can look at something weak and call it strong because he's God. Now, we are weak, and we look around, and sometimes, you know, we see that person, we go, oh, what can they do? What do they know? What do they have? But God sees them and sees something else. And so God saw Gideon, and he said, you mighty man of valor, rise in this your strength, and you will save Israel. And family, I want to remind you, see as God sees. If we can see as God sees, how does God see you? You know, we like to make excuses for ourselves. But how does God see you? Oh, does he see your weakness? Yeah, he sees your weakness, but what does he say about that? Forget your weakness, it's my strength that you need. Does he see your knowledge? Yeah, he knows what you don't know. But he says, forget your knowledge. It's my knowledge that you need. 
Lord, what, the resources. Listen, the cattle on a thousand hills are his, and he won't give you or send you anywhere without backup. And so we just need to rejoice and understand that God will never put more on us than we're able to bear. It's we need to look. When God sees us, he's seeing what we will be. And so, family, you know, I guess it's hard sometimes because we live in a natural world and people just don't believe. We are, the scripture says that the God of this world has blinded their eyes. Most people will never see stuff that we talk about. You know, sometimes, you know, some of us, we've gone through redundancy, we've gone through crisis, we've gone through this, and we're still happy. They say that, you know, getting married... Uh, going through redundancy, going through redundancy, are the worst and most stressful times in life. And I remember getting married, going through redundancy at one point, and I was happy. And some guy said, don't you, why are you happy? And I said, well, don't, but you're going through all these things, and you're getting married. I said, well, yeah, but, but, but he couldn't understand. Actually, my joy isn't tied up in a job. My joy is tied up in who he is and the fact that he's called me. And you see, our joy is, is, is a different thing. And so family, you know, it doesn't matter what we got. It doesn't matter how rich or poor we are. It doesn't even matter about our education level. Don't you know all the apostles, they were unlearned Galileans, weren't they? They didn't know much, but did they know much? You see, when you rely on yourself, you're going to be in trouble. But when you trust God for revelation, you're going to see something and you're going to be something. But when you start looking at yourself and say, I couldn't possibly do it because who am I? Then you know what? It's the wrong perspective. And we need to see as God sees. Now, when God sees us, he sees children of God. He's children of the king. God is powerful, so his children are powerful. God is holy. His children must be holy. But you see, we hold back because we think, oh, it couldn't be me. That's a plan and an attack of the devil. So when sickness hits us, when, when we see sick, we can run. You see, the, Jesus, when we read the uh, New Testament, often I think one of the outstanding characters of Jesus was compassion. The scripture says he was moved with compassion and healed. He was moved with compassion. He felt compassion. If we can see as Jesus saw and, and, and move with compassion, then we can, when we feel, when we connect with the Spirit, we can just lay hands and it shall be done in Jesus' name. And we think, but can, can we do it? Can we do it? But I'm not a pastor. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a... No, you're a child of God. And that's enough. That's enough. So the secret of success is really seeing as God sees as we go through life, seeing as God sees. If we can see as God sees, we won't see the little fluffy thing that's nice but very weak. We're going to see a lion because this is how we fight our battles. If we can see as God sees. Now you might say, well, well, Gary, fine, I hear you, but this is my perspective. I don't see myself as the lion. I'm the kitten. I don't see myself as strong very weak. I know my weaknesses. It can change. And so I want to suggest just a few things how we can change our perspective. Number one, recognize that there are other ways of seeing the same thing. There are other ways of seeing the same thing. There's a whole lot going on there and a whole lot of people are seeing different things. It's the same thing that we're seeing, but there are different ways of seeing it. Whatever we go through, it might look impossible, but there are different ways of seeing stuff. And if we can understand that there's your view, there's your view, and his view, and her view, and then there's God's view. And so whatever we're doing, we just need to seek God's view. What is God's mind? What is God's view? How does God see my situation? And if we can see the situation as God sees the situation, we're doing all right. How does God see it? It doesn't matter how, but sometimes we look at the situation and say, oh, we, we, we're finished now because the situation is so great. How does God see it? How does God see it? And it's how God sees it that really matters. So instead of asking God to change our situations, ask him to change our perspective on the situation. Instead of asking him to take you out of the fire, ask him to help you go through the fire. We see this quite clearly, that God is not a God that will shield us from the stuff around us. No. 
because he wants us to go through and demonstrate his love in the fire. He wants us to go through and, and demonstrate his kindness in the waters. He wants us to go through the same things, but show the world that even though I go through the fire, the, uh, the waters, they shall not overflow me. And even though I'm through the fire, in the middle of it, I will not be burnt. And that's who we are. This is how we fight our battles. We walk in the name of Jesus. We stand in the name of Jesus. We stand up for God. This is how we do it. Because we don't look what the eye sees. Because the eye will mess us up sometimes. It looks impossible. The doctor says it can't work. What did God say? What report we will believe? What are you going to believe? So don't say, Lord, take me out of this season. It's such a hard season. I pray that prayer so much more than anybody else. Lord, I'm in this season. My back's against the wall. Lord, oh, woe is me. Woe is me. Get up. Lord, I'm in this season. What do I need to do to go through it? Not just go through it mashed up and broken. I want to go through this strong so other people going through it with me can say, how can you go through and be so strong? The fact is this, we need to reach people. If you're going to reach people, you've got to be where they are. I think it was Mike that was talking about when he was, uh, he, he was sick on the walk and he went into hospital. And God had something planned for him there. Was it that Mike had to be sick? No, but God had something for him in the midst of it all. If he said, Lord, take this off me, just imagine God healed him and said, right, fine. How is that poor guy in the hospital next to him, how is he going to get the word of God? And so sometimes when we go through, let's ask, Lord, take it on from me. No, Lord, what do you want to happen in this terrible situation? It's only terrible when God isn't in it. When God is in it, it might look terrible to everybody else, but guess what? It's a blessing. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> And that's the hard thing, you know. It's about perspective. Sometimes people think we're crazy. We're crazy. It's not that bad. <laughs> can't you see what's going on? It's not that bad. Can't, can't you see what's going on? No, because God is right there and he will fix it. God will use the weakness of man to show himself mighty. He will use the foolishness and the foolish things to show himself strong. God wants to show his glory through us. And no, he's not going to use superstars all the time. Just ordinary people. If it was, can you imagine if we had to choose Mary? How, if, if God says, right, I want you, Lorna, or you, or you, to choose Mary, who's going to be the mother of our Lord. Can you imagine that? If it were me, right, Mary. Mm. Right. She's got, she's got to look good. She's the mother of our father. We want her to be beautiful. And then, what? Her dad was a drunk. No, forget that. We want her parents to come from good stock, right? We want her to be, she, she's not that bright. No, we want her to be bright. And by the time we put Mary's CV together, it'd be like, who can we find such a person? <laughs> because it's the mother of our Lord. She's got to be good looking. She's got to be good stock. Her parents got to be good. Everything's got to be tick, 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 tick. And the one bad thing, she likes to drink. Forget that. <laughs> but, 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 but God comes and he, he, he messes us up all the time. He comes and says, right, I'm going to choose somebody. Mm. We discount, right? So we've got the good guys here. The guys that we don't even want to think about, we put them over there. And, and God comes and says, right, mm, right I'll, I'll have one of these. <laughs> I'll have one of these. Remember David. David, we're going to find the king. Well, all right, guys, you come. David, you don't need to come. You, <laughs> go, David. And God says, well, guys, this is what you've chosen, but I'm going to choose the broken things. God, I'm going to choose something that nobody else would have chosen. Just ordinary people. You know, if I said, if you're a superstar, put your hand up. How many of you put your hand up? If you're a superstar right here, put your hand up. Okay. If you're just an ordinary person, put your hand up. That's all of us. Wow. Guess what? God uses ordinary people, plain old ordinary people. If that's you, give God thanks because you've just agreed. God uses me. I'm plain, I'm old, I'm ordinary, just me. I don't have any special skills. 
I'm not a private superstar. You know, I'm not, I don't have the, you know, the, the big S on my chest. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just ordinary. And God says, right, I want to use you. I want to use you. You see, when the world discounts, that's when God says, yeah, I love that one. You know, in the lineup in school, you see that in the lineup in school, there's always that kid that no one wants to choose. You have him. No, you have him. You have him. <laughs> School's a mean place sometimes. You have him. You have him. And, uh, but God will say, I'll have him. And I'm so glad he chose me. Out of all the billions in the world, he chose you. He chose us. But he hasn't called us as we are. He hasn't called us ordinary for us to remain ordinary. He's called us ordinary so we can become extraordinary. He's called us ordinary so he can invest in us, so he can anoint us, so we can become extraordinary. We just need to see it as God sees it. And when we see as God sees, everything changes. And so, uh, uh, number one, if we're going to change our perspective, we've got we've to recognize that regardless of what we go through, don't matter how bad it is, there's always another way. Number two, choose to believe even if you can't see it. Choose to believe it. Sometimes it's, it's different. We, we got, we've been made with a choice, right? And uh, sometimes they say you've got to face your fears. On the way to it, you've got to face your fears. We've got to choose to believe even when we can't see it. What possible good could come from this? Choose to believe that God is in the middle of it. The only thing you need to know is that I'm a child of God. You know, if you're a child of God, choose to believe but I can't see it. Choose to believe. You see, we've got to be, we can believe the lie that the devil gives us and presents. We can choose the situation, the man-made weather, however it came. We can choose that this is it. We're done. Or we can choose to believe God loves me, he's put me in this, and God is bigger than the situation. We can choose to believe he did it for my brother, he did it for John, he did it for Peter, he can do it for me. We can choose to believe he healed Mary, he healed Joseph, he can heal me. We must choose to believe it. We've got to be people that don't just believe what we see with our natural eyes. We've got to begin to see as he sees, and if we can't see as he sees, we've just got to believe it anyway. Choose to believe. Choose to believe you're loved. Choose to believe God wants you. Choose to believe that you're called. Choose to believe that God has prepared you from before the foundation of the world. Choose to believe that. Choose to believe that God isn't vindictive. If God was like man, we'd be in trouble, right? Let's just get this point. If God was like man, yeah, you're saying that, but I remember what you did. He doesn't hold scores. If, 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 if God was keeping scores, I'd just walk out now and say, guys, forget that, right? Because he, he's got so much ammunition. But he doesn't do that. He, he, once we repent, it's gone. Thank you, Jesus. We repent, it's gone. So as long as we stand in him and say, Lord, thank you, I've repented, we know that he's chosen us. We know he's prepared us. We know that he will never leave us. You know, sometimes, you know, you, you want to step out, but you're scared. And you think, Lord, should I pray? Should I lay hands? I mean, this is, this is a big sickness, right? <laughs> if it's a headache, you know, we run to headache. I'll give a headache. Can you imagine? We're going to pray for the. You got these people over here have headaches. These people are lame. Those are dead. Which queue are you going to join? <laughs> I'm in the headache queue. I'll pray for the headaches. Lorna will pray for the, the lame. Sarah, you do the dead right. It's all yours, you know. I've got no problem. It's, you know, be my guest, you know. <laughs> But here's the thing, it takes no more power from me to heal the headache as it does to raise the dead. Because guess what, none of it is my power. So the fact really is, it's about what do I believe God will do through me. It's not us, it's him. And so God said, be audacious. It's my power. And the thing is, we think, we see, and then we grade it. Headache. Three, lame, six, dead, off the scale. <laughs> and we think, well, you know, I'll take a chance on the three. In the name of Jesus, be healed. The six, back me up. Come on, there's the five of us will tackle this one. Be healed. The dead, you know what? I'm just going to have me excused. We need, we need somebody else on this one. But God uses ordinary people who will just see as he sees. 
and step out by faith. Yes, it's a challenge. Step out by faith. When he called Gideon, he said, Gideon, I want you to do some stuff. Gideon was so scared. He said, I've got to test this one. And I guess we do that. But let's, God wants us to succeed. He wants us to, uh, 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 to, to really represent him. Number three, very quickly. We must reprogram our minds. The scripture I read, it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We've got to change the way we think. We've got to change. Why? So that we, we do that so that we can, we, we can prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Have you ever seen something that's unique or, or, or seen a watch? And you think, you know, that's a great watch. I haven't seen anybody with it. Or have you bought a car? And you think, well, you know, what? There, are, there aren't many of these cars, so I'm going to get it. Or you buy a dress. You think, oh, that's a beautiful dress. I really like this. And you buy the dress. I mean, I remember Lauren and I, we were going to a wedding. And my wife had me shopping for this dress. She didn't want a dress. She wanted the dress. <laughs> and I guess you ladies will, will understand. And, and we went, up, she, she dragged me around in blue water and uh, lakeside. And I remember she, it, it went from, yes, yeah, really nice to, I don't care what it is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and this carried on for a long time, and eventually she got the dress, which looked like all the other dresses to me. But anyway, it was a nice dress, and uh, she was good. And we, so we went to this wedding, and it was exclusive, and she thought, you know what? And we went to the wedding, and she was feeling good. Remember, Lauren? And then Terry Smith walks in in the dress. <laughs> And then somebody else came in, the dress. <laughs> and it was quite funny. Um, I think she wanted to go home. <laughs> but the fact is, you buy a car, and you think, because there aren't many, and then you start seeing the car all over the place. Do you know what I mean? Or you buy a ring, you think, oh, that's really excuse. And then you notice everybody's got that ring. I thought, oh, gosh, I thought it was the only one. Why does that happen? It happens because of uh, our, cognit our cognitive, the way we learn. And the way we learn is when we, we're oblivious to something, it's not that it's not around, it's just that we don't notice it. But once we, once we learn it, once we buy it, it becomes known to us, and therefore we recognize it. So it seems as though we're seeing it all over the place. Actually, we were seeing it all that time before, we just wasn't recognizing it. And so when we, uh, conform, when we transform our minds, what we're doing is we're tuning into the spirit. We're learning to tune into the spirit. So things that we would have missed, we're now recognizing. Functions from the Lord that we would have missed, just like that ring, the dress, the thing that we would completely over, go over, we're now recognizing and picking up. So we need to transform our minds by tuning into the Spirit of God. So when God says this, we recognize God's move. When, when we walk here, we recognize God's hand. It's about recognizing what God is doing us with us in the workplace. It's not just about here in the building, in the church. It's about we are the church because wherever we go, we represent him. And then when we're tuned in by the Spirit of God, we begin to learn. And this is how it begins to happen. Recognize time. God will, God will, God will bring stuff to us because we're now tuned into the Spirit. He can then lead us. He can then direct us because we're tuned into his Spirit. And so finally, I just want to close <laughs> uh, by saying what happens when we see as God sees when we see as God sees when we see as God sees things begin to change and we know the story of David and Goliath the whole of Israel saw the big guy at the back that was Goliath they saw Goliath and they said no way can we manage no way can we fight can we win it's useless and Goliath would come out and say yeah I just want someone to challenge me who's there now Goliath saw that Goliath saw himself as the big guy but then there was David. David came along and David saw as God saw. And so David said, wait a minute. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that will did not defy the armies of the living God? Who is it? Who does he think he is? Does he not know the God that we serve? Does he not understand that we serve? It doesn't matter what that might look like. Do you know who we serve? And family, I want to tell you, when you begin to look through God's eyes, it doesn't matter what you're going through. Do you understand the kind of God we serve? 
There is nothing too hard. There is nothing impossible for him. There's nothing that he cannot do. There's no battle that you cannot win. There's no sickness that cannot be healed. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that you cannot do. There's no situation that's too big. There's no war that can't come down. There's no mountain that cannot be removed in the name of Jesus. And so family, hallelujah, hallelujah. We need to realize that when God is by our side, we are already overcomers. When God is with us, we have already won the battle. You might not see that the the walls have come down, but they're already down because we don't have to look with our natural eyes. We just see as God sees. So so David, he saw as God saw. And he said, I don't know how this is going to happen, but I know that this guy's coming down. David didn't even have a sword. They wanted to give him all the natural stuff. So I said, take my sword. David said, no, I've I've not tested it. Take my shield. No, I I can't. David went out there just as he was with a little sling. (laughs) People are going to think you're crazy. How can you face that? How can you go through that? What are you bringing? You're bringing your Bible. Are you... Do you realize what you're facing? That was David. And he went down there, and in the name of Jesus, the big giant came tumbling down. I want to say to you, whatever you're facing, regardless of what people are saying, and there's people, because the devil wants to mess up your perspective. They'll tell you, you cannot win. But in the name of Jesus, sometimes your own family, in the name of Jesus, you have already won. And you already have the victory. You've already taken this town in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You have already overcome, but it's still hard and I'm still going through. Yeah, it's just a matter of time. Time just needs to catch up with what God is doing. And God's will be done on earth. Where? As it is already done. Not as it will be, as it's already done in heaven. We just need to catch up with what God's already done. Thank you, Jesus. And so, in the text... The servant is surrounded, uh, and they're surrounded by soldiers. But Elisha, who saw as God saw, (laughs) he wasn't perturbed. He saw something different. He saw something different. We are Elisha's today. We carry God's word. And I tell you today, I declare it today, that surrounding us is God's angels. We are not alone. We can't see it with our natural eye, but sometimes you feel his presence. We, we, we can't see it sometimes. And sometimes I think, why am I in this situation? Have you ever thought, Lord, why is the circumstance worked out the way it is? I know there's going to be something in it. God will work out. He's working it out. And so family, see as God sees. You are more than enough. You have what it takes And God is working with you. Don't look to what you see with the natural. Because the natural eye will fail you. It will trick you. The devil will use it to tell you that you're not enough. And you can't overcome. You can overcome. Because he's overcome. This is how we fight our battles. When the enemy says no, God says yes. This is how we fight our battles. We defy everything that comes against the name of God. We defy that. We defy sickness. We defy in the name of Jesus. And we say it is done in Jesus' name. I'm done, family. (laughs) (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) 